Welcome to the Washington Bike, Walk, and Roll Summit presented by Amazon. This is our final session of the summit, which is crazy to say, but we're happy to have you all here and excited for this conversation. Um, just to make sure that everyone's in the right place, this is inclusion in the cycling community, and we'll get started here. So I'm Tamar, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'd like to welcome you all again to the Washington Bike Walk Roll Summit presented by Amazon. And we're excited to have 600 participants for this five day virtual event. It's been an incredible week and we're excited to sort of fold it all up in this final session. We'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, the summit is virtual and those participating are joining us from many lands. We acknowledge the land that Cascade sits on as the traditional home of the Duwamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and Suquamish tribal nations. Without them, we wouldn't have access to this environment, and we take the opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. If you don't know whose land you're on, you can take a, a look at the chat in a few moments where you'll find a link to figure out what land you are sitting on today. We'd also like to note that we are recording this session and that the recordings will be available following the summit. So the summit is hosted by Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes, two sister statewide organizations with a shared vision of bicycling for all. Cascade serves riders of all ages and abilities throughout Washington State, educating new riders, advocating for safe places to ride, and holding rides and events. Washington Bikes uh, advocates for bicyclists' rights. It endorses political candidates, holds officials accountable, and works to shape policies that will make bicycling safe and accessible for all. We wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors whose collective contributions have enabled us to bring together 15 panels of expert speakers and free registration for all attendees. So thanks to Amazon, our presenting sponsor. Thanks also to our supporting sponsors, the Washington State Department of Transportation, Active Transportation Division, and Eastern Washington Region, as well as our general sponsors, the US Department of Transportation, Federal Highway Administration, and Stacey Bain Bike Lawyer. So with that, and before we transition into introducing this final summit session, we'd like to take a moment to articulate the community expectations we've had for all our summit sessions. We will maintain a standard of conduct to ensure that all our participants feel safe and respected. We believe every person has the right to be treated with dignity and respect and be free from all forms of harassment. We ask that you be fully present in this session, be self-responsible and self-challenging, listen and process, suspend judgment of yourself and others, and use respectful language towards each other and the panel. Also, if you have any questions or concerns during the session, feel free to reach out to the chat monitors through the panelist feature on your chat bar. I'm now so excited to introduce this final session of the summit, Inclusion in the Cycling Community. Our panelists are Marley Blonsky, an advocate for inclusive body sizes in bicycling, Maggie Vincent with Wheelhouse Community Bike Shop, and Tiffany Young with No Limit Riders. In this session, we'll talk about what inclusion looks like in the cycling community. Our attendees will learn about efforts to increase inclusion for migrant and low income communities, disabled folks and fat cyclists, and will be challenged to explore their own relationships with their bodies, regardless of size and ability and movement. This session will also include real world advice about equipment considerations for fat people and folks with disabilities when biking. Join Maggie, Tiffany and Marley for a conversation about widening the bike community and inclusion in all of its forms. We're starting off with this brief introduction and then our panelists will be introducing themselves as well. We'll dive into some discussion and then we'll have time for audience Q&A at the end. Um, we're encouraging all of our attendees to ask questions via the chat bar and our chat monitors will be directing those to me to ask during our Q&A time. Also, uh, your feedback is really appreciated and we will be providing a feedback form at the end of the session also in the chat bar. So please check that out and share your thoughts with us. And with that, I'll stop sharing this screen um, and we'll pass it over to our panelists and we'll talk about the work that they do. So Marley, would you like to kick us off? Sure, I would love to. Uh, can you go ahead and start sharing my slides please, Tamar? So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Marley Blonsky. Uh, I recognize a lot of names. I haven't gotten to meet you in person, 
hopefully at some point when all this is over, we can. Um, so I'm here to talk about fat biking um, or creating size inclusive bike communities. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, we already set some community norms. Um, we actually already did a land acknowledgement too. So all the things I usually do, we've already done. Um, but this next slide is actually quite important. Let's go ahead and go on to the next one. Um, we already set some community rules, um, but as we're starting to talk about, you know, bodies and body size, um, I do want to set some additional ground rules um, because some of the things I'm going to talk about are a little bit sensitive. Um, and the first time people hear this, they tend to bristle or like, oh my gosh, you're really saying that about yourself? Um, so just want to put these out there. Um, one, fat isn't a bad word. Um, as we're going through this or you're asking questions, I would really strongly encourage you, um, let's not talk about diets um, or what we eat or anything like that. Um, no body shaming, please. Um, all bodies are great bodies. Um, please be aware of coded language and what that can mean. Um, and we might get into that a little bit later. Um, and then finally, just celebrate your body for what it can do and not what it can't do. Um, so the work that I do, um, some of you guys might have seen me in the Washington Post or some of the other things that I've done. And I'm really all about making the bicycling community um, more inclusive to people of all body sizes, um, but especially people in larger bodies or uh, fat people. Um, so I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit more, but there's, uh, you know, lots of things that go along with that from equipment and clothing um, to what bike shops and the bike industry can do better um, to, you know, group ride etiquette. There's so many different facets to it. And I'm really excited to, um, to talk about this today. And so thanks to Cascade and Washington Bikes for helping put this on. So real quick intro for me. Thanks. I will pass it on to Maggie and I'll get your slides set as well. Thank you, Tamar. And thanks to the organizers of this amazing event. I have just learned so much this week and I am just um, so thrilled to be able to cap off a week of learning and, and coming together with folks of similar interest. Um, so I'm Maggie Vincent. Um, I reside in Kennewick, Washington. That's in central eastern Washington. Um, there I am uh, working in the community to cre help create transportation independence for, uh, for anyone who's interested. I came to biking. Um, I'm not naturally a biker. I came to biking due to injuries and wanting to spend time with my family. Um, That allowed me to take on some roles at an adult age that are not necessarily ones that you would see. Um, and as I began working here in the Tri-Cities, I, I, opportunities just kept coming and I just kept learning and I saw um, spaces where I could step in. So today, um, a lot of education and a lot of time there. I work with uh, we several organizations, but specifically I'm here to represent Wheelhouse City Bike Shop. Um, our role is really to increase bicycle use in the Tri-Cities. We put bicycles out to the community for those who may not be able to um, afford them. We teach safe cycling skills to help them get around. We teach maintenance and bike repair that give people the skills to want to ride farther, be, be more independent and more confident on, on their bicycles. So as I, as I look through the slides that I've sent to you, these are from some of my classes. Um, you'll see me at a wheelhouse event that was collaborated with our one of our local libraries where we brought in bicycles and did classes. I'm teaching a five-year-old uh, mother, a um, couple of middle schoolers, how to change their bike tires. Up in the upper right, I'm at one of our Title I school, middle schools here in town, where I am co-lead the programming for an after-school bike club. 
the um, kids in that bike club this winter, besides learning how to ride safely in their neighborhoods and around on um, the fleet that's owned by the school, Wheelhouse sent over bikes to be refurbished. The kids learned how to refurbish those bikes, earned bikes of their own by doing so as part of our earn a bike program. And through the, we've actually kept track of those boys through the pandemic and they are getting together, riding to each other's homes and getting together um, to ride. So that's really exciting. Um, in that upper right or upper left hand corner down below is my women on a roll program. This is a program that Wheelhouse is very, very proud of. I'm actually a graduate of that program, and that was one of the places where I started to actually expand my training and my impact in the area. You see in front of you two women of an age who hadn't been on bikes since they were kids. They learned how to ride safely in an urban environment. They learned how to repair their bikes and how to build bikes. So they now, I see them out on the road all the time. Included in that was also a college student. And down below in this sleek cycling gear on the left bottom is one of the other Title I school um, after school program leaders, getting her TS 101, traffic skills 101 testing done so that she could continue to teach her class. These programs that we, that we um, execute there in the Tri-Cities are growing and growing. They're creating confident, strong, skilled cyclists that pass it on. The mothers are teaching their daughters and sons. The young boys that um, Tamar is uh, covering with her cursor there <laughs> are teaching their neighbors and fixing their brothers and sisters' bikes. And all of this is just creating a groundswell there that person after person, I keep track. Every time I talk to them, I'll say, oh, who have you taught about biking? And um, it's, I just count those numbers and they're growing on a very um, frequent basis. All because the board members of the of Wheelhouse Community Bike Shop said, let's have a program for women and teach them how to fix their own bikes and teach them how to ride in our suburban environments safely. And I want to thank those people because you've helped me to make a big difference in my community to help other people have transportation independence, go to jobs, go to schools, go to stores in from areas where they can l afford to live but don't have good transportation solutions. So to the board, thank you. Awesome. All right, I'll stop sharing these slides and I'll pass it over to Tiffany for our last introduction. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tiffany Young. I'm still a little new from the Motor City, Detroit, Michigan. Um, I am the vice president of the No Limit Riders Bike Club. And um, if we could show that first slide. Tiffany, I think that you have the slides if you want to share them. Gotcha. Sorry about that. Worries. Okay. All righty. Um, I am, as again, I am the vice president of the No Limit Riders Bike Club. Um, it was founded in 2018 by Dwayne Big Work O'Neill. Um, unfortunately, we lost him in April uh, due to COVID, and uh, but we are continuing his work and his legacy and his advocacy. Um, these are my brothers and sisters, and uh, in the wheelchair is again. Uh, Big work, 
Um, and as you can see, he was also a disabled bike rider, as am I. Um, that is one passion we both shared was to advocate for the disabled bike rider. Um, as a bike rider, a disabled bike rider, I have uh, endured um, some negatives and I've also uh, been blessed with some positives of being a bike rider and being disabled. And that is um, just one of our passions as a bike club that we wish to share. Um, and the bottom uh, with the word monster on the, the bike, uh, that's my bike brother, Dame. Uh, as you can see, he is also a disabled bike rider. Um, he uses an electric bike as I do um, um, to assist him in riding. And um, one thing um, my story does share a little light on is the custom um, cruiser bike cycle community. Uh, not as far as the uh, professional uh, with the speedo pants and the helmets. We're, we're a little more flashy, as you can see on my next slide. Uh, we really trick out our bikes. <laughs> um, here's a stretch or a couple of stretches. Uh, this was a big event at one of our big uh, parks here in Detroit. Um, we do give one heck of a light show at night, um, and, but that is one of our safety precautions as well because uh, um, most of us are pretty well lit up. My bike itself looks like a spaceship, and uh, but it keeps us all safe. And if there's anyone riding with us that doesn't have lights, we surround them. Uh, we all take care of each other and uh, as a club and as uh, we're all unified um there's uh bike life is not only just in detroit it's nationwide it's actually international there's a bike club that has a connection in um russia and that is the hot spot rollers so we are there we, bike life is international and yay um this is one of our that's our little mascot diamond at the bottom um, she rides with my bike sister, Trinity. Um, but um, we just promote um, inclusion. Just anyone should be able to ride that has the passion to. And um, as you can see, as a club, we are very, very serious about supporting our community. These are a couple of things that we do. Um, we give out food. Uh, we also give out presents. And uh, we do a lot of things mostly um, off season, which is like now September till about April. And in April, we all get rolling and on the streets again. But one thing that we do share as a club, as clubs and uh, as independents, not necessarily having to be in a club. If you just, you say you're a bike rider, you're a part of bike life here and we include you with us. Uh, we do a lot of advocacy at the, the government, local and state levels. Um, uh, uh, the one picture of myself with the little hat with the ball on the top, um, that was for the, our Greenways Coalition. I try to make as many meetings as I can because that is what they need is they need um, voices from the actual bikers in the community, it's people like you and I. And they one that is one positive about the Detroit Greenways Coalition is that they put out regular PSAs and, and things of that nature so that we can participate in the types of voting and things that they do to help keep us bikers safe and build uh, infrastructures and bike lanes and things. And one of the big things that, um, if you can see in this lower page where uh, those are a couple of club members um, with one of our state representatives and behind them is one of our big um, government advocates in bike life, Mr. Todd Scott. We really appreciate him. He's a great man and he's gotten us actually connected. And um, those two cl uh, bike club members you see there, they are actually um, on committees. They have been appointed to committees to help. And that is one of the focuses that what we are trying to move forward to is inclusion of the disabled biker. We do have a significant amount of people who are disabled that ride with us. And um, we are starting to do more um, bike, we call them bike rolls. Bike rolls uh, where they, where we, we say everyone is welcome. Uh, we won't make accommodations. And um, because that's very important to us because we do understand that they are just like us and we would like them to be included and to feel safe. So that just speaks a little bit, I guess, about my mission, my passion, um, my club, 
my city, and my <laughs> bike life. So um, as far as my work, <clears throat> I have my own nonprofit, Iman Community Services. Last year, we gave away 547 bikes to the children of Detroit, adults and also adults in transitional housing, such as um, Common Ground Sanctuary, South Oakland Shelter, um, Butzel um, Community Recreation Center, and surrounding um, elementary schools, because um, we got those bikes through FB4K. That's free bikes for kids. They go around the country and they come to Detroit in Christmas time. So we give them away for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was what we did last year. And we hope to double that goal this year. And we just kicked off. We're cleaning the bikes, refurbishing them. And uh, particularly with my work at South Oakland Shelter, uh, we used bikes. I brought bikes into the shelter as a barrier breaker for clients that had transportation issues. And uh, we started with 10. We got another 10. And at last count, I believe they have 50 in a shed that is free and available for our clients to use, whether they need to go to doctor's appointments, um, anything. So not only do I guess I deal with the disabled biker, I deal with the disadvantaged biker overall. So I'm, um, I guess I'm very glad to be here. I'm glad to share my story. I'm glad to share my friends, my bike life brothers and sisters. And I hope that we can get some, some insight and some assistance. Uh, oh, one more thing I'd like to share. I'm just looking kind of down at my notes. I think this is a very important. Um, I recently just started partnering with uh, Trek Bikes um, regarding their all-in initiative, which is a grant um, funding. And I wish and I hope and I pray if I get it, we will be able to open a local, local urban store um, thanks to Trek Bikes because they do recognize that the urban communities are significantly disadvantaged as far as access and affordability to bikes. So um, hopefully I'll be seeing a trick bike start one day. So thanks for letting me share and I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Well, it's amazing to have all of you here. I so appreciate those introductions. Um, I'd love to jump into some questions here. Um, these are open to all of you, so feel free to jump in with answers. But so this panel is about inclusion. The work that all of you do is about including different kinds of folks in the cycling community, as Tiffany was saying, not just people wearing spandex and you know that typical vision of a biker that so many people have. And I'm wondering what inclusion really means to you and what would that look like in the cycling and active transportation community? Big question, but would love to hear your thoughts. I would love for it not to be a big deal that I'm a fat person who rides bikes and it to be a total non-issue. Um, it seems to be this radical act that I ride bikes for fun and transportation and adventure. Um, and I would love it if more people, especially, um, you know, fat women, fat men, fat kids, um, just did it and it was no big deal. That's what inclusion would really look like to me or, you know, people with disabilities. Um, they saw it as a safe thing to do, as reliable, as um, like affordable and that it was just like, oh yeah, I'm going to get on my bike and go to the store and I have a safe place to park it and I have a safe lane to ride in and like that's what inclusion would really look like to me. Like there's bikes that fit, there's like a raincoat that works. Uh, <laughs> I know I harp on that every time I talk, but I want a stinking raincoat that fits me. Um, that's what it would look like to me. And if, if I just saw, and honestly through COVID, I've seen so many more people who look like me out riding and it feels so good. Um, it feels like this revolution is starting. So that's what it would look like to me. But Maggie, Tiffany? Yeah. So I'd like to go next. So to me, inclusion um, in active transportation means that anyone and everyone who's able can move around in our community without a car. Uh, I live in a really suburban area with a lot of major highways going through right through our neighborhoods and um, it does not feel safe. Um, I would love to like Marley said, it not be a big deal for me to get on my bike to go wherever it is I need to go. 
I'd like to be able to walk or to bicycle with you know anyone and everyone see see everyone out on the out on the road out on the on our um, beautiful bike paths that we have here have sensible routes for all that keep us out of the danger dangerous interactions it means that to me it means that our spent our, our friends who go far and fast um, sometimes hang back of it with those of us who go slow and meander and that we all enjoy that to get that tr commute together if you will um, i'd like to turn active transportation into the norm rather than the oddity it is in my suburban um, city Um, I think inclusion for me, um, particularly because when I first came into bike life, a uh, few people teased me about using an e-bike. They used to say, oh, you're cheating, or you're not really doing anything. And, um, you know, and it, and it, in the beginning, it used to hurt, you know, and I, at first, I didn't want to tell people, you know, I need this bike. That's why I have this bike. But um you know, just for, and, and I do see it now because they are now more acceptable. You know, a few years ago, e-bikes were like the new, ooh, what is that? But a lot of more people have them and, but they're doing it for speed and they're doing it for, you know, endurance that may be able to go longer. I'm doing it just to enjoy it. Um, and I, I just, in, I've seen, you know, like, like, as I stated, you know, we do have some people who are disabled, um, <clears throat> where it is visible. Um, inclusion for me for is for all that stigma to disappear and they just see a bike rider. You know, we all have names down here. My bike name is Purple Rain. So, you know, instead of saying, oh, look at Purple Rain on a, on a red like e-bike. What about, hey, what's up, Purple Rain? about me, right? Instead of what I'm riding, as long as I'm riding and uh, I have a friend um, who has cerebral palsy and uh, he has a trike and uh, he actually rides better than me. And uh, the stairs that we get, you know, and that's another reason why I like to stick to him and stay close to him and also to make sure nobody takes advantage of him. Um, but inclusion for me, I wouldn't have to worry about my friend. And I wouldn't have to worry about what people say or what people think when they see people on adaptive bikes, bikes, or they look at my bike brother Dame flying down the street with one leg. I mean, he's a biker, so that's what inclusion would be for me. I I loved it the other day. Um, Swift Industries, who's a big name in the kind of adventure cycling world, they had this video contest um, for this big camp out that they do. And the winner was actually this group that one of the folks on it was on a trike, uh, which was so awesome and just like so cool to see this um, company who typically caters to, you know, like the typical adventure bro, like branching out. And it was a fat man on a trike. I was like, yes, 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 yes. This is so cool. and. I think we need to applaud those companies who, um, and just people who are doing the representation. Um, but I feel you on the e-bike. I've got one um, that I use occasionally and I absolutely love it. So um, they're life-changing. And I think that f from my perspective, um, I, I think that it's about accessibility, right? Tiffany, you couldn't go the places you go if you didn't have your e-bike. Not right. at all. Not at, I'm not even a block. I, 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 I love to tell this story about one of the young men in my bike club. So he's probably 12. And um, we were talking about getting uh, their earn a bike. And I said, well, what kind of bike you were? Now, I had been combing the shop for a good track for him, you know? I'm, I'm combing the shop for a name brand bike for him. He goes, well, I just need a mongoose. We need to be able to say, you have a bike, you can go, you mm -hmm. can go where you need to go, where you want to go. And, you know, everyone can go regardless 
of whether you're wearing your spandex, whether you're riding a mongoose, whether you're riding, for those of you who don't know, I ride, um, when I'm teaching, I ride a 1983 vintage Peugeot mountain bike. <laughs> and it's lovely, <laughs> but it takes away that intimidation factor. And so if we're more aware, less aware of what, and as you said so eloquently, Tiffany, if we're more aware of the person themselves, what are they bringing individually? You know, how, how are we, they changing what's happening and using their walking or their bicycle or their bicycling or their skateboard, um, I, I, it, 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 it all becomes more inclusive. We're all closer to community. I love that. Um, Tiffany, do you have a follow-up? Oh, I was just gonna say absolutely, absolutely. So I guess the question that comes from this is when you think about what inclusion looks like and what sort of work you're doing to promote that, I think you've all sort of alluded to this, but I'm wondering more about what are the barriers or the challenges that you and the communities you work in and represent face? Sort of what are you coming up against in the work that you try to do every day? I'll start this time. Um, so uh, the Tri-Cities is, um, is an area about a quarter of a million people in five, with five, city governments and within 20 miles of each other. So that in itself is, is a barrier. Um, there are so many city governments, there's no global metro go government. So it's, the planning is fractured. If, you know, we, if we are looking at it from, if we from Wheelhouse are looking at it from a global perspective, we have to go to five or seven different planning committees, okay? So that's problematic. They're good about talking to each other and they're all together, but it's, it's still problematic. Um, we have a very traditional suburban, auto-centric uh, design, city design. So for, in terms of active transportation, it's um, a very big barrier to uh, a very big barrier. Um, accessibility, the economic divide is is very significant, very significant. You know, on the one side we have um, highly skilled white collar workers. On the other side, we have seasonal and service workers. We have a huge wine industry and fruit industry here. Um, vegetable and what have you packing um, those folks you know have three to five jobs per household the children are home alone uh, they lack services they lack um, they have language barriers and they most certainly don't have room to invest in and um, a specialty items for active transportation um, you know Bicycles, if they can get them, make a great um, can, can make they can make a great difference to their um, lifestyles. But you know, I think that that is the biggest barrier that I'm working on here is just you know accessibility for those people so that they can, it just helps to change their lives, makes them able to get to a better a, a higher paying job or helps the kids get to the library or the rec center or whatever. Um, the barriers, there, there are a couple here in Detroit. Um, <clears throat> first one is money. <laughs> uh, we need money, we need money, we need money. Um, we have um, one of the um, big hospital organizations here, um, Health Alliance Plan. They started uh, hat bikes here, and they're the, they're orange, and they have the hubs, you know, where you can rent them for a period of time. And um, they just introduced e-bikes. Um, they're black. They're real cool. Um, 
But the thing is, first of all, people to rent them. They re I did recently see something where HAP received a grant, um, especially due to COVID and people being unemployed and things of that nature, the crisis, uh, that they did, um, people that are on a, um, state assistance can receive them at an extremely reduced pri price, if not for free. Um, I think I saw until January. Um, but in spite of that, we have a significant need here in Detroit. And we also have a significant need for money because our, our the services we do have, they are very oversaturated and they are just very minimal, just to be frank. Um, that is one of my passions and mission is to advocate for some more resource for here in Detroit. Um, big barrier. Second big barrier is uh, for people to take bikers seriously. Um, especially the bike life community the cruisers and um of course we receive some stigma um um that we just ride around and we're just goofballs and we get drunk and we pass out on our bikes and that is as you can see absolutely not true um of course we like to have fun like everybody else but we have higher goals and definitely higher agendas um so if we could have people really take us seriously and that's why uh, Mr. Todd Scott embraced us um, and kind of helped us kind of get nudged into the local and state government because they are starting to see, oh, these people are very smart. They um, have a lot of insight. They have some great ideas. Wow, let's listen to them. So, um, but we need just things like this, more opportunities to um, have platforms that we can go further instead of just Facebook or Instagram. I mean, you know, my hope and my prayer is that people will see this and recognize um, um, the needs that are in Detroit and come see us and help us out. Um, other barriers um, would include um, kind of like Maggie's and it's kind of oxymoron. We're in an urban area where there's tons of buses and in, in streets and things of that nature, but they're seriously dilapidated. Um, and also um, the appropriate ways to get there. I mean, we are just getting bike lanes. I would say, I think I just saw them pop up a few years ago. Of course they were in the suburbs, but getting them in the urban communities where they're mostly needed. Um, funny story, one of the, uh, bike like guys I showed in my um, slide uh, that's at the government level now advocating for us. Um, he said that when he first got out here, um, there was absolutely nothing. And, you know, of course, there was a lot of guys that just didn't have cars. So they started riding their bikes to work. And that's actually how bike life got started. Instead of them being teased about it, they made it into something cool. So. That's another barrier, again, a stigma. You know, it's not cool to be on a bike, you're a scrub, or you know, you're not trying, you're lazy, you need to get a... Actually, biking in this area is one of the best ways to get around. You can get to a concert a lot easier on a bike in Detroit. Yeah, um, I would echo both what Maggie and Tiffany have said. Um, you know, first thing I think is there's a, a, fin a financial leap. Um, I think a lot of folks don't, know how much a bike costs or what it takes um and so they go out and look look for a bike that's strong enough for them and they get really turned off by the price point um so i think you know that's the initial barrier um i think there's also like some knowledge and some gatekeeping in the cycling community that keeps people out and if you're just starting out um you sometimes don't even know what questions to ask you know is it even appropriate to ask am i too heavy to ride a bike like, yeah, that's an okay question to ask because there's different frame materials. There's different like things on a bicycle that have weight limits. Like let's get rid of the gatekeeping and let's accept people who don't know anything about bikes. There's no question that's too dumb. Um, I would say, you know, also like the cultural expectations um, that if you're a fat person, you're getting on a bike to lose weight or for exercise. Um, 
that stops a lot of people because they're like, no, I just want to ride for fun or I want to go out and ride with my kids, but somebody's going to look at me funny or I'm not going fast enough or I have to walk my bike up this hill. Like we all have to do that at some times or another. Um, actually, there's going to be a, a short film coming out about me uh, with Shimano in spring, I think. There's going to be a lot of me walking up hills. Um, I was joking with the filmmakers that it's just me taking my bike for a walk, not actually riding it. Um, but I think also, I've talked about this a couple times, but clothing, um, you know, we have this image, this cultural image of what a cyclist looks like. Um, but if you're in a certain body, they don't even make clothes that fit you. Um, and I think all these barriers are, we can knock them down, we can get around them. Um, and I think, it, it, you know, it takes these different communities coming together and saying, that's a bunch of crap. We don't care about that, you know, going to the wheelhouse or building, refurbishing bikes and making them cheaper or working on grants, things like that. Um, getting the knowledge out there, but um, it takes all of us to do it. Nice. You're getting a lot of love for being an uphill bike walker. I'm in that community. <laughs> well, <Wow. laughs> um, and I think a question that comes to mind for me of hearing about these barriers and hearing about sort of the, the movement that you want to see in the community, I'm wondering, there are a lot of people on this call who are advocates, who are engineers, who are everywhere in between and I'm wondering how can folks at all of these parts of the bike community spectrum what can they do to support the work that all of you are doing there are so many people I think that want to make biking more inclusive make the bike community look more diverse and representative but don't really know how to get started if they don't feel like they're a part of the fat cyclist community or the disabled cyclist community or low income communities. So how can they support this work that you all do? Contact us. <laughs> no, seriously, yes, contact us. But also um, for you engineers out there, can you find some ways to maybe come up with cheaper ways to make e-bikes, adaptive bikes? Um, make, can you make them as light as possible? Um, those are the things that I would think of um, as far as uh, engineers or, or anyone in any other arenas. Um, you know, if you need any ideas, suggestions, um, or you need somewhere to start, just uh, feel free to reach out to us. I love that, Tiffany. Yeah, thanks, Tiffany. And, and I would say just start somewhere. Find someone on on a bike and have a conversation. Ask about why they bike. Ask about you know what they would like to see, and then find what calls to your heart. I um, no one, no one could have convinced me even three years ago that I would be teaching bike mechanics to women and children. I mean, I had a, I had, I, I should grab it. I had a mechanic. It was called a music card. Yeah, and so I'd say just take any step. You know, if you have a community bike shop in your neighborhood, walk in the door and start talking to them. Find where your passion is. If you see some somebody bicycling by themselves, ask if you can join them or walking by themselves, ask if you can join them. Just step out, step up, listen and find collaborators. I'm always amazed when I'm out in the community, and I do this quite often um, because of the work that I'm doing. I'll just be going out and I'll just do that. I'll say, you know, I, I'm, you know I, I do bicycling and I raise money for bikes for um, those in need, at risk um, individuals, and, um, you know, do you bike? store owner or whomever, you know, do you, do you have kids who bike? Do you fix your own bike? You know, and, and really just start a real conversation and listen to what they have to say. Find people to collaborate with. That's the second step. You know, I was lucky to come to, um, I was lucky to come to Wheelhouse and they gave me a great start, a great launch pad, and they're great partners. But I now work with Bikes for Tikes um, as a marketing and fundraiser. 
I, um, you know, the work with Pasco School District and uh, my partners there to um, get bike programs into their schools. I think it's just make a step, any step, just make a step, talk to somebody, you know, hopefully in your neighborhood. Yeah, my ask is really specific for anybody who works in a bike shop or the bike industry, um, educate yourself. Um, I get this question so much and I'm like, I'm just a normal person. Um, every bike manual has weight limits and it says like the structural weight limits. Um, know that information so when people come in, you're educated and you can have that conversation and you don't need to be like, oh, how much do you weigh? Okay, well, this bike is not strong enough for you. But educate yourself in a way that it's like, well, you know, we can build stronger wheels or know the bikes in know the weight limit just the same way that you would talk about the air pressure or um, different components, you know, it's, it's a safety issue. Um, or, you know, replacing brake pads is going to have to happen more often for people in heavier bodies. Um, that, that's my really specific ask for people who are in the deep in the bike community is just educate yourself. Um, you know, me and Kaylee Kornhauser have put out a lot of information to the world about how you can be a better ally. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there about being an ally to people of color and to people with disabilities. And that's all intersectional across all of this. It's not just, you know, in one aspect of your life, but it's in bicycling, it's in every interaction. So apply all of that to this as well. <laughs> yeah, snaps for that. Um, we're going to go over to some audience attendee questions. I'll sort of just shoot these out rapid fire. Um, there's a question for the whole group, which is in thinking about the bike community versus mainstream society or just the world around us, do you think that the bike community is more or less open and inclusive than, than our day-to-day -day communities that we're in? I think parts of it are more open. I think we're kind of the land of misfit toys in some ways. Um, so in, in some ways we're a lot more inclusive because it's like there's a lot of us weirdos out there just doing our own thing. I think there's some really <laughs> insular parts of the bike community, um, not naming any names where you have to, you know, look a certain way or ride a certain bike or, you know, have the water bottle put in a certain way. Um, but those aren't communities that I choose to be a part of. Um, so I think it goes both ways, but I think that's every community. I agree. I agree with Marley. I think, you know, it's, it's a two sorted thing, um, you know, from my experience and um, we're just people like everybody else. I do. I don't know if you guys would agree that um, cyclists are a little bit centric, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> and um, I know uh, I've enjoyed our panel here on just uh, even in uh, previous meetings because I think we all have a little spice and uh, we keep it lively and uh, I, I do see that trait with a lot of people in the bike life and um, and uh, as Marley said it, I don't know personally about the professional arena um, the speedo loving people and and everything and I say God bless them and great job with your 32 plus miles and all that good jazz but I would prefer to cruise the river listening to some good Marvin Gaye. Um, I think I, I think that there's two parts to that question. I think when you look at the bike community as a whole I think they're very accepting. I think that that they're eager to help and be inclusive I think that the barriers that we talked about earlier keep people from being able to access that, um, that community. So from a perspective of the people who are in the community, I find them, you know, overall to be genuine and, and inclusive. But I think that there are a lot of barriers in place that keep us from being e even more so. Thank you. And just a quick note, there's a request that if you're able to put your contact information or some way for our attendees to, to get a hold of you, if you'd like to put that in the chat bar as we keep going through these questions. Um, 
But Maggie, there's a question for you that you touched on earlier, uh, but I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more to the efforts that you've put in and the work you do around increasing inclusion to migrant communities, low income communities in your area and what that looks like. Um, yeah, so, so that's been a real organic process for us. Um, our, so, so a lot of our um, migrant and Latino population is in uh, one of the cities. It's pretty heavy in that one city. And um, it's really evident, we speak to this a lot, that there are no bike sh shops over there. There are, no, there are no sporting goods shops over there. You cannot get a bicycle tube in that side of the, uh, of the, of the Tri-Cities. So um, I, I tend to, um, I have a lot of people in the organization who have really great personal networks, and then I tend to go through the more structured networks. So, um, you know, my partner in the public, in the Pasco school program, um, and I are on first name basis, you know, on each other's speed dial with the superintendent of the schools. They connect us up with the um, community support folks there, help us to understand what's going on, what's needed. And then they can, and then we're also connecting there. Um, you know, we've only been at this for a year really, but we're also connecting with um, special coordinators and um, community, community activists in that area who have a vested interest, many of whom live there, many of whom work there, and then we work through them. Um, I'm really excited that we're having our first, um, uh, our first um, tube and tire clinic in one of the huge um, apartment complexes out there um, next week, where we will take tubes and tires from our shop. We were discussing how many gallons of slime we needed to take because there is a huge um, tackweed problem out here. And, and, and then how are we going to set up the stand so that we can safely in this time of a pandemic actually get individuals bikes fixed up and ready to go and then the coordinator at that location is actually going to take um, help us take residents with their bikes on on a quick ride afterward um, we've been wanting to do this for oh pretty much the whole time that I've um, been working with this um, you know with the wheelhouse and I'm I'm thrilled to have it and I can't wait to you know continue those connections to the next neighborhood and the next neighborhood and the next neighborhood so that we're actually in there so so I think that's a really long answer connect with the con there are a lot of activists out there and I heard this a couple of times this week connect with them, connect with them. They will know what the need is, they will know the best way to approach this, and they will definitely um, welcome you in a way that is non-disruptive and is um, really reverent of the community there. And that just creates so much trust for you and allows you to, um, you know, just brought in your circle too. Nice. Yeah, that's definitely a through theme is if you want to do work that actually is what communities need, you should probably talk to those communities and see what they need. Um, Tiffany, we have a couple quick questions for you and then I'd like to wrap it up with a final question for the group. But the first question is, can you just remind folks of the name of the shelter that you are getting bikes for? Um, okay, um, uh, there were South Oakland Shelter, that was in 2017 and 18, which is now has merged with Lighthouse. Lighthouse is and South Oakland Shelter merged into one. And now Lighthouse is the biggest one in Michigan. Um, and the other one that is still um, goes by the name, uh, it's, um, oh gosh, um, Common Ground Sanctuary. 
Um, and it's, um, they have a couple of locations and um, they have a children's um, for a runaway or homeless children. And then they also have an adult transitional. And they actually, what it is, is they have the adult separate and the children separate, but there are some children that stay with them until they attain age 18. And then they transition into the adult transitional program. And then at, at that point, they, they continue on. And they also do just walk in community like a food pantry um, a system resources just for the community in general. Very cool. And then the second question is, in your experience, are typical bike racks available and usable for bicyclists with disabilities? Not at all. As a matter of fact, um, I am looking at, um, I recently purchased a new vehicle, but I had a regular bike rack and it's, my bike is so heavy and i and i've gotten to the point where i just can't lift it um and it's it just sat on there awkwardly and because the bike is so heavy and it's wobbling i mean i prayed every time i, I transported my bike and now that i have a new vehicle um i don't currently have i need to get a new hitch but what i'm going to do because there are no really nothing stable for a bike that heavy and i'm looking to to get a ball hitch and get a trailer and I do know that those are significantly more expensive. Um, um, I currently have been, not only for medical reasons, I'm waiting to have surgery next month, I've been unable to ride, but also because of the barrier, I can't transport my bike. Um, because I do have to save up to get a ball hitch so I can do, uh, you know, the something that's more, you know, than something that I can handle, which would be a trailer. So I'm hoping to get one next year if I can get the money together. I've already started pricing them, but um, that affordability, uh, uh, availability. Um, I don't even. I've looked at you know some professional places. They are very expensive. So I'm looking around. I'm asking around to my bike life um, friends and brothers and sisters to see if someone can maybe help me find one at cheaper cost. Help me build one. I don't know, um, but that is a significant problem is availability and affordability for disabled um, individuals to transport. Sounds like something that we could maybe get some people in the audience to start brainstorming around how we can make that more accessible, more affordable for folks. Um, we just have a minute or so left here and I just wanna hear from each of you. You've touched on it a little bit, but what are you really looking forward to working on in the coming days, weeks, months? Um, what is what are you excited about? What what can people look forward to from you and the work that you do? I'll start since I'm unmuted. Um, I am um, I am really looking forward to getting back to it. You know, um, all of my classes were in person before, so I'm having we're having to retool this bike safety classes, parts of the mechanics classes, and and I'm just looking forward to get getting back into that. We're heading into the time when those actually occur. Um, I'm also looking forward to just being able to get back with those people who are interested in um, learning, learning biking and um, making, yeah, you know, learning biking and getting back out on the road. For me, um, I already mentioned it, but I've got the short film with Shimano coming out, which is really, really exciting. Um, it'll be coming out in the spring. So keep an eye on, I guess, We'll probably work with Cascade, do a screening, I would imagine. Um, we don't know the details of it, but keep an eye on that. Uh, and then uh, the other thing I'm working on is this Monday movers and shakers on my Instagram, which is really fun. And I've been trying to like take the spotlight from me and put it on to other people and highlight the work that other folks are doing in the bike community. Um, so I would love to highlight, you know, what Tiffany's doing, what Maggie's doing, and just uh, really there's so much cool things going on in the bike community that. Um, getting the word out, but also hopefully some more inclusive sizing on things will be coming out and um, I'll have a rain jacket this winter. We'll see. If you know of one, let me know. 
Harley, call me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what can you look for from Tiffany? Um, first of all, like I said, um, I'm looking to have some surgery next month. Um, that will probably uh, keep me down for about three months. Uh, I'm looking very forward to riding next season, hopefully um, pain free. Um, I'm looking forward to possibly a potential um, connection and uh, approval for a grant from Trek Bites and uh, work on possibly getting this uh, local urban shop for local bike life. Um, uh, my nonprofit, um, look forward to us uh, getting a whole lot of bikes out there to the Detroit communities for Christmas and hopefully um, connecting with some groovy person that I met um, on this podcast and uh, hopefully making some beautiful advocacy and uh, prosperity for all bikers in the near future. Nice. I love that. Well, thank you all so much. I, I so appreciate you being here this evening. Um, it's really been an incredible week and I feel so honored to have this be our last session and to hear from such incredible people doing incredible work. I hope that our panelists, um, I hope that our attendees reach out to all of you and I am excited to see where the work goes from here. So thank you, thank you to our attendees and I hope everyone has an awesome evening and a great weekend. Thanks, Thank Tamar. you so much. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank Thank you, everyone. Have a great, great night. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Bye.